Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media. The secret to learning motor skills is to not overthink things. And I'm going to make sure that I'm that person who's here for them today. I'm going to be their hero. St. Louis has a beautiful future ahead of it, but we don't lose track of what we have. Today on Spotlight, the science behind how we learn and why it brings us joy. Plus, how local BioSTL could become a global leader if there's another pandemic. And then, a new exhibit exploring motherhood and family relationships. But first, meet Missouri's Teacher of the Year. It's Sunday and you're watching the Emmy Award winning Spotlight. Each day at Crestwood Elementary School, students gear up for their physical education class. Now you're going to go to the second one. Now you're going to give them another good pass. Their joy is playing games with each other and spending some quality time with a special teacher. He made me feel much more stronger as a learner in PE. And when we always did exercises, he'd always make it in a fun way. He makes me feel like, you know, happy and like feeling at home because like he's just kind, caring and a good person. Darian Cockrell, affectionately known as Mr. DC, an alias resembling a superhero ripped from a DC comic book. If his nickname gives him superhero status, perhaps this recent honor could give him rock star status. PE teacher Darian Cockrell. Darian Cockrell teaches physical education. Elementary school gym teacher Darian Cockrell. I'm choked up just looking at your face. Mr. DC is Missouri's Teacher of the Year for 2021. He deserves it and he, he's just a, a great teacher. We have a lot of really amazing teachers at our school and in our district. So you kind of look for something that really stands out, something special. He spends a lot of time going to see kids perform, whether it's basketball, um, football, gymnastic events, dance recitals. He'd always let me dance every single time in gym. It made me more confident as a dancer. It made me feel like I had more power to dance and it made me more connected to him. He doesn't make a big deal about it and a lot of people don't even know he does this. It's just something he does to make those connections with the kids. When I first found out that I was Teacher of the Year, when I seen that banner and my wife ran out with my son, she said, baby, you won. It was fear because I knew the importance of it and I knew that with this platform, I need to make sure that I was on my P's and Q's because it was very important for me, especially as a black man, in this position, in this role, that I do it to the best of my ability. Which he practices daily. But as a child, performing to the best of his ability was a difficult challenge. The horrors of an impoverished life made it seem almost impossible. My father, unfortunately, I lost when I was four years old because he was the biggest drug dealer in, in North St. Louis, and he got killed over that. My mother, unfortunately, was in and out of my life because she was battling with drug addiction. At six years old, he and his brothers and sisters were in and out of foster homes. But the state of Missouri eventually awarded full guardianship to their grandmother. I live in Fountain Park area. Known as one of St. Louis's most dangerous neighborhoods. We live right next door to a vacant building. Junkies, drug addicts, and crack eggs are living in those. Going to those inner city schools where I started my educational journey, it was tough. I feel that these teachers don't want to be here. They're doing the bare minimum, you know, they're just there just to get their check, do whatever they think they need to do, and then they leave. There is no connection, there is no love, there's no support, there's nothing that's inspiring me from those teachers. His grandmother provided a loving home, but it wasn't enough. Life was a continuous struggle. Love my grandma. She was the best thing that could have ever happened to me, but she wasn't even making enough money to support us. Our lights are off. We don't have food. We need to figure out how we can get money to live. Us as boys, we're like, we got to hold our end of the bargain. We got to hold our end of the table and we got to figure out how we can help our grandmother. And we figured the best thing that we can do is look up to those guys who is in our neighborhood that we see in every day. So, by the age of nine, Mr. D.C. was in a gang. 
I don't want to sell drugs. I don't want to steal cars. I want to do anything possible to make sure that my family is financially stable. The great thing was because I was in the DSED program that bust me from the inner city out to the suburban schools, that hour that it took me to get to school, it allowed me to think like, what do I want to do in my life? Obviously, there's more stuff out here than what's in my neighborhood because I'm seeing it. To him, life seemed good in the suburbs. But it put me in a mindset that I can have this. And I had to understand that what do I need to do to get to this point? But his gang life was like a ball and chain, dragging him away from the life he wanted. So the Missouri Division of Children and Family Services intervened for the last time. The state knew it was a burden on my grandmother and they wanted to take some of it off of her shoulders by taking away the two oldest, which was myself and my brother. They knew that in order for me to be successful, I needed to be out of the environment. And Mr. DC never looked back. So you'll go one, two, three. I teach off of my past. I teach off of love, I teach off the stuff that my grandmother, you know, instilled in me, but I also teach off of appreciation and just being grateful to have things. I don't ever want them to feel like they don't have someone in their corner because that's the worst feeling that you can ever have. And I want to make sure that I'm that person who's here for them today. I'm going to be their hero. Mr. DC. He may not wear a cape, but he wears his heart on his sleeve. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. For Tom Vanderbilt, it all began trying to learn chess with his daughter. There's a great quote from a, a grandmaster saying, you know, before you make your move, look at it as if you were a beginner. A is for apple. But how do we learn new things, especially as we get older? Those are the questions writer Tom Vanderbilt began to answer by dedicating a year of his life to learning five new things. Just having sort of a short attention span in life, um, I sort of worried about committing myself, going all in to uh, one thing. He had plenty of ideas. Some people had given me some great suggestions, like learn to make gelato at Gelato University in Italy, and yes, that, that is a thing. Sign me up. Eventually, he settled on surfing, singing, chess, drawing, and juggling. <laughs> Turns out learning really is all about taking baby steps. The amount of times infants fall in an hour while trying to learn to walk is staggering. I think the number one lesson there is just appreciating failure. Not just what you can learn from failure, which is important, but the idea that you are going to fail a lot. The book is called Beginners, but it's not a how-to, it's a why-to, celebrating the joy and transformative power of lifelong learning. It would be easy to get bogged down in the details of all of these five things that you try to get some competence in, but the overarching point of the book really is about how we learn. What about that initially intrigued you and was there an aha moment along the way where you realized, ah, that's that's the key? A couple things that sort of jumped out as I was working on this is that number one, a lot of the hurdles I were facing were, were really mental hurdles, not, you know, it would be easy for me as a, as a 50 something person to sort of blame physical, you know, limitations or, well, I just not as quick as I used to be, um, you know, for, for some of these things getting in the way. But a lot of these things are really mental hurdles. Just to take one example, when you're trying to learn to sing and, you know, I'm sort of a, in the baritone range, there were certain notes that were a bit higher that were very challenging for me. But as I would try to hit these, just doing scales or whatever, I would have this, you know, sensation of, of stress come on and my body tightening. And almost like physically, my teacher would say I was physically reaching for these high notes, like, like a giraffe, she said, my neck was sort of stretching up. All of that is terrible, a terrible way to try to sing a high note. You know, singing in general, you want to be as relaxed as possible. Um, just keep your body loose. So my teacher came up with this little trick to sort of fool my brain into not thinking I was singing high notes, which was to actually bend down every time I approached a high note. So I sort of, you know, that little, you know, muscle trick sort of fooled me. And, and after a while, I, I was starting to hit some of those higher notes. That, that's just one example. But there are a lot of things in almost all the disciplines this would come into my mind that my brain getting in the way of my body, uh, and which is the, se the secret to learning motor skills is to not overthink things, <laughs> and which any beginner does a lot of. 
uh, just make one last what one last point here is that you know beginners if you look at them as a class in, in something like surfing they're always paying attention to themselves to their own body like they're looking down at the board down at their feet which is really the worst thing to do it sort of gets in the way of this whole process this whole conversation going on between your brain and your body and just reinforces a lot of bad habits so there's always some trick out there look at the shore don't look at yourself and when you get to be an expert you're no longer thinking about anything this is automatic behavior but the beginner stage is hard in that you're always thinking well the book is called beginners the joy and transformative power of lifelong learning and it's available in st louis at left bank books it's a great read great book tom vanderbilt thanks so much for your time thank you paul it's been a pleasure Sitting in the morning sun. Scan the QR code on your screen with your phone's camera to watch the full interview and find out if Tom thinks online learning is more effective than in-person learning and how stereotypes play a role in performance. HEC Media presents Talking with Authors, the podcast. Your favorite writers and genres with diverse subjects and styles. Like New York Times bestselling author Brad Meltzer, crime writer Karen Slaughter, Charles Fishman, Sarah Kenzier, Judy Bloom, with new podcasts dropping bi weekly. Subscribe to Talking with Authors wherever you get your podcasts. From HEC Media, Left Bank Books, and the St. Louis County Library. Scientists in St. Louis roll up their sleeves in the fight against COVID 19. Confluence Discovery Technologies developed a potential COVID-19 treatment by retooling an arthritis drug. Another team of scientists with the academic spinoff company Precision Virologics created a new COVID-19 vaccine, a nasal spray now in clinical trial in India. And the hope is for a clinical trial in the U.S., including St. Louis. St. Louis University has an NIH-funded vaccine evaluation and treatment unit. And Washington University has many well-known basic scientists that have critical model systems. And so together, these ingredients give us a starting point that many regions don't have. And scientists in St. Louis are already thinking about the next possible pandemic, developing the science and technology to be prepared for the future. This is where the startup Vax Numo steps in. One of the pandemics that we think um, will be in the future is the antimicrobial resistance pandemic. So our company focuses on bacterial vaccines. Antibiotic resistance is growing more and more, so much so that by 2050, the World Health Organization thinks that more people will die of these antimicrobial resistant infections than cancer and cardiovascular disease. Vax Numo and the others are located in the Biogenerator, the investment arm of BioSDL, which is driving life sciences innovation in the St. Louis region. BioSDL hopes to attract more pandemic-related innovations to St. Louis with a near $3 million federal grant. The federal government held a competition for programs that would advance the economic resiliency of regions uh, during and post this pandemic. Um, it was our view that because of our position uh, in orchestrating for St. Louis, a strong bioscience ecosystem, that we were positioned to compete not only on economic resiliency, but on pandemic resiliency, the resiliency uh, developing innovations that could help our nation uh, prevent, mitigate, recover faster, from uh, future pandemics and future health-related crises. Having now been awarded the three million, BioSDL president and CEO Don Rubin says the grant will create the Center for National Pandemic Resiliency in Biosciences. This will allow BioSDL to develop and build businesses around any technology that can predict, monitor, treat, or prevent a widespread disease outbreak. St. Louis can be a leader in developing and discovering some of those ideas, advancing technologies that are going to be very important to our entire country and our entire world 
if we have another pandemic. It's estimated the center will attract $20 million in private investment with an even greater impact on the St. Louis region. And Rubin says the center will boost the nation's ability to fight pandemics. Over $700,000 of this grant that is dedicated to grants that we will make to startups and to innovators to help advance their idea or to advance their pilot. The companies addressing the current pandemic already having BioSTL support believe the federal grant and new center are promising for everyone. Really good article in the Atlantic Monthly where they talked about for people of my generation, the threat was communism and all the money went to defend against it, nuclear weapons. For the new generation, the threat will be pandemics. So I think this is going to be the major growth area of biomedicine in the next decades. BioSTL is positioning itself to capture what are anticipated to be unprecedented resources and investment from the NIH and government. St. Louis in watercolor, later on Spotlight. We are at Hauska Gallery at my show Mombi Magic, which is an exhibition of multimedia work that I've created since 2018. So I'm a trained painter and drawer. I have my master's in fine arts from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, but I was born and raised here in St. Louis. Guest curator Jessica Manisi invited me to be a part of this show here at Hauska Gallery. And I was so honored because so many of my respected peers have exhibited here in this beautiful space in the Central West End. And here we're looking at works um, that are mixed media. I have works on paper, paintings with oil and acrylic on canvas, as well as other materials like lint, hot glue, faux fur. And then I also have a collection of my Mombi's sculptures, which are hand-painted glazed stoneware. My Mombi sculptures are a series of what I call Mombi's, and that definition can be found in the Urban Dictionary as like soccer mom driving a minivan, a mom who's incredibly sleep deprived or who sort of prioritizes her children over everything else. I am not as interested in that definition of a Mombi. Mine is more in general, thinking about caregivers, and these figures that are nervous and scared but filled with joy and love that are basically here to like save the world. That's my goal with making this little army of mombies. I do not have ceramics background. I have more of a painting and drawing background, but I've been able to sort of explore the same ideas in a three-dimensional way, which has been awesome. The works on the walls, which includes the works on paper as well as my mixed media paintings, I started working with more invented imagery when I moved into my new studio and after I had a baby. I found that the more sort of sterile abstraction I had been working with, which was really a lot of organic shapes, wasn't getting the point across anymore. And so I started working with, again, this imagined, invented imagery of mothers, grandmothers, caregivers, imaginary babies, ideas of domesticity, as well as the sort of overwhelming fear and also the overwhelming joy and love that can be involved in these pretty messy relationships. Issues of sexuality and motherhood and caregiving um, and health, women's health. So I want the work to be emotive. I want it to reflect on all those ideas, but I also want it to be exciting and inviting and like a party because even though there is darkness in all of these relationships or issues that I am discussing, there's a lot of light too. If you'd like to see this work in person, come to Hauska Gallery by March 27th. And you can also go to Hauska Gallery's website, hauskagallery.com, or you can view mine at amyrydell.com. HEC Media, supporting and promoting the arts. Check out our features and shows on theater, dance, music, the visual arts, and more. Find this and all our award-winning content at hecmedia.org. Ice cream has changed my life twice. Once when I was a kid and it changed my sense of community, and two, when I decided to leave corporate America and start Clementine's. Think about a microbrewery for beer, but for ice cream. 
you know, we're small batch, we're handcrafted, we're all natural, we have low overrun, and it is Clementine's Naughty and Nice Creamery. And the naughty part of our ice cream is I have a trade secret process for infusing alcohol into ice cream up to 18%. So our naughty ice cream is really naughty. I do all of the flavor creation for us. That's where the flavor temptress comes in. I love ethnic flavors. I love uh, unique things that people wouldn't normally think about putting in ice cream. So when I was in Italy, I came across this amazing pine needle sap. It was called Mugolio, and they would sometimes use it in salads or on pork chop, like, like savory dishes. And it was so amazing and it was so cool. I said, I want to do a Magolio flavor. Or, you know, I do a Manchego with truffles and honey, right? So introducing a beautiful Spanish cheese with like shaved truffles and using local honey. It's really fun to be able to blend like the best of the bounty that we have here in Missouri with really cool and amazing unique ingredients from around the world. We opened our first store in Lafayette Square in May of 2015, there was this old wine bar that had been closed down for a couple of years, but it was really tiny and it was like in the worst corner at the end of a street with no parking. Uh, everyone said I was nuts. And so I did it and it was just amazing. From May 15th, 2015 to December 31st, we had 57,000 people come through my little 500 square foot ice cream shop. It's been just this amazing journey of love and support from this awesome city that I live in and the, the people who live here that want to see all independents do really, really well. Clementine's Creamery just named best ice cream in the United States and they're on Oprah's favorite <gasps> things list. Oh my Congratulations. The, all of the national press that we've gotten, yes, it's amazing for us, but it's so great for the city. Being able to put St. Louis on the national map, even if it's just in ice cream, is an incredible privilege. Rising tides raises all ships, right? The better that any of us independent businesses do and get national attention, the better that all of the businesses do. You know, we're gonna be a national brand someday very soon. And so now it's just a matter of putting one foot in front of the other and making the best ice cream in this country every day. I'm really just a strong woman that never, never gives up. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. I'm showing my view of St. Louis, whereas uh, a photograph is just photographing it. I can edit and make it the way I want it. At one time, I didn't have the city building here. At one time, it used to have Bush Stadium. Bush Stadium's gone where it used to be. Um, and things have really changed. I am Marilyn Bradley. I'm an artist. I did all the illustrations for the book, St. Louis in Watercolor. Here is what I like. This is the one over at Faust Park. Marilyn Bradley has been painting for over 60 years. Her favorite subject is St. Louis. Her first published book in 2008 was all about the city's architecture. This book, St. Louis in Watercolor, Living History in the Gateway City, digs into its past and its present. This started out in St. Louis, and it, the bottle itself has evolved and moved and moved from place to place. There was more than one bottle. So this one is downtown near the arch, and it's one of the last left. And this all came from the World's Fair. I don't know if everybody knows that. U City really began because of the World's Fair. There are over 100 paintings in the book, each with a story. Forest Park is younger than New York's Central Park, but 500 acres larger. The Boathouse Lake dates back to 1894, and we have 6,000 people to thank for digging it by hand for a dollar a day. Eat Right on Choteau Avenue has been around since 1935. 
The diner was renovated in 2018, but COVID closed it completely. The lamp, naturally, everybody knows that it's haunted, but you can stay overnight. I don't know if people realize it, it's a guest house. This particular building has so much history. It was next door to the Demonel house. Demonel is, goes all the way back to show the same family. So the lamps were next to it, but there has been a lot of suicides in the family for here, and even in this particular building. And I think that's why it's, they consider this a, a ghost house. She paints with watercolors, I paint with words. Jennifer Grote-Peter is a wordsmith. She authored the stories in the book. Everyone knows St. Louis is rich in aviation history, but did you know that Charles Lindbergh actually got his start on a mail route from St. Louis to Chicago in a plane housed right here at the Historic Aircraft Restoration Museum. And you look at the aircraft behind us and you may not realize that those shiny wings are fabric. You're in a fabric airplane. The scarf is blowing, trying to keep the castor oil off of your face, and then you ingest this castor oil, and we won't go into what that does to you later, but they don't cover it in flight school. One of the stories reads like a true crime podcast. Webster Groves was founded on a homicide way back in 1896. One day, a man named Bertram got off the train from Chicago. A young teenager offered to help him with his luggage. After taking him to town, he stopped inside the local saloon to tell his friends of the well-dressed man with cash. And one of the boys suggested that they rob Bertram. And one of them had access to a gun, so he went home and got his gun. And they didn't know Bertram was also armed. And he shot one of them. So they shot back, and Bertram died on the spot. At the time of the murder, Webster wasn't officially a town and had no police department. The outrage continued in the town, and they're like, we need a police department. Let's be a town. So they incorporated as a city exclusively to hire police. And the second thing they did was start taxing saloons until they taxed them all out of business. And until about 2017, 2018, somewhere around there, there were no saloons in Webster. What is now Laclede's Landing holds a lot of history. Its cobblestone streets are the only thing left from the original 1780 French settlement. As the urban legend goes, it also houses a haunted alley. Following the Great Fire of 1849, there was a cholera epidemic. People were dying in the streets. The cemeteries were full. You've got nowhere to go with those bodies. So they started stacking them up in Clay Morgan's Alley. To this day, spirits, it is said, can be seen roaming the streets of St. Louis. St. Louis has a beautiful future ahead of it, but we don't want to lose track of what we had. And I think that's what's important about the book. Marilyn tells a visual story. I give you a written story. But there's so many stories. Next week, a new high school class partners with an ad agency to teach students business skills virtually. Plus, an adventure about a dangerous mission to transform the Wild West. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.